<laughs> Are there any questions from what you have seen this morning? So, um, as a brief summary, so we had, when it comes to data frames, we had long format, of, we have ugly data. But we don't want to upgrade ugly, ugly data, and you will not get any ugly data from me. Um, but keep in mind that if you have your own data and you need to, I'm sorry, I did not imply that you have ugly data. Um, but if you have some data that you want to load it, load it into R, uh, be mindful that um, it will, your life will be much can be, can be much simpler if the data is probably formatted in your in a spreadsheet for kind of smooth um, import into R. But so, <coughs> sorry. So when it comes to data frames, we have long formats and wide formats. And some of these data formats are easier to spot some features of the data or visualize some features of the data. For example, missing values. We had an example of missing values with the wide format. The missing values are there, and I think that's a feature. Um, whereas in the long format, they might be there, but they might. Most of the time, they are not. <clears throat> and then... Um, I also introduced you to the to an Amazon set, but um, this is a general data, data, data structure that you'll find in um, omics data, the microarrays, or high throughput sequencing, or quantitative proteomics data, um, and I'm sure metagenomics, they have similar data sets, <clears throat> where your actual data is split into three parts, one that contains the actual expression, the quantitative data, and this would typically be matrix, not data frame. Uh, feature metadata that can be accessed with the F data, capital D, F data. And having it like this guarantees that every row, every protein here has its matching metadata. And that holds true if you do you know, anything with the data. If you, if you transform it, if you filter it, if you subset it, uh, this will always, these two will always remain ordered. And as part of an analysis, you would then add feature metadata annotations such as p-values, um, cluster um, membership, if you do some clustering on your on your proteins, your class membership, these information can be added throughout the life of your data set. In addition to the feature, we also have sample metadata, where each sample here, uh, the rows here match exactly the dimension here, uh, where each sample has the same type of mutation. And as before, you can add sample annotations without perturbing the rest. And this structure is guaranteed, this uh, matching of um, dimensions is guaranteed as part of this data set. But I think it can, it's easy to convert these data structures to data frames by extracting whatever piece of information you need. And although we haven't seen this in detail, but it's also possible to take any data frame, a white, in the white format, and convert it to an image. Um, I have added on the, on the Google Drive, navigate to the Google Drive, um, in the Program 6 folder, I have updated <coughs> the data.zip <coughs> file so that now it contains all the data sets that, we, that were generated this morning that I can show you here. So my suggestion would be Download this file again, extract it, and put all it, its content somewhere where it will be uh, readily available. In my case, I put all these files in my data. <clears throat> if I list the content of my data directory here, they are. If we have already done it, should we delete the previous one or go back to the 
uh, the, the zip file, um, you can re uh, rewrite or overwrite it or delete it. And all. Oh, no, I, you will get more with the new file. <coughs> yes? Oh, yes, yes. Um, is it here? Here. Oh, so it's... Um, let me copy and I will add it. And so could you put your blue sticky notes up <coughs> once you have all the data? Or if you're happy, you will be able to download them or you don't need them. Okay, can I assume that you uh, all have the data? Yes, very good, thank you. Could you take your <coughs> blue sticky notes down? So what we are going to do this afternoon, and this is a little bit ambitious, we'll, we'll see how it goes. So I appreciate that uh, it was maybe a little bit fast in the beginning, uh, in the first session, um, but we need to compromise. So we'll try to do as much as we can, and maybe I'll drop a couple of things that are not as important in this section, and maybe in that, that section. <clears throat> um, but of course, I don't want to rush through everything. Um, and then, especially those that has, are not yet as familiar with R and GGP2 and Deep Violet, these people get left behind. On the contrary, I would prefer <clears throat> to make sure that the people that have less experience get, get as much as possible from this course. Because I think those that are very familiar with R, they will be able to pick up the nodes and read, uh, or even you know, advance at their own pace. So it's perfectly fine for me if you think, it's a little bit too easy for you, you want to go through the notes and do it. Um, of course it's fine for me. So please don't hesitate to tell me to slow down, or tell me to repeat something, or if there is you know, something that we see, if you tell me, oh, I don't quite understand this, um, that is perfectly fine. <clears throat> feel free to tell it on the spot, or feel free to write in all your sticky notes that you'll leave here before the break. So, um, the program for now is dplyr for data manipulation and ggplot2 standard uh, visualization package for um, data visualization <coughs> and so these two here we will focus on data frames and tidy data and in particular in the long format so here I have represented one of these data frames and <coughs> I'll mostly be using the IPRG data Oh, and by the way, let's load it to load the IPRG data. There are two ways this IPRG data exists as a CSV file. Um, it, it is this one. Or I also always, sorry, also provide it as an R data file that can be loaded. So either um, load this file or read dot or read underscore CSV this file. Um, to read it in. So I'm going to load data IPRG and that, that provides now the RPRG data um, in, in my workspace. It was actually already available. <clears throat> so IPRG had this structure 36,000 rows, uh, 7 columns. So we're going to use dplyr to manipulate this data. And there are four actions that we are going to do on these data sets, <clears throat> on these data frames. The first action is to select a set of variables of interest, a set of columns. For example, we are interested in particular in these two columns. And so selection of variables is done with a function called select. We might also want to subset a certain number of observations or rows, for example, these ones here. And this is done with a function called filter. Another type of 
general or generic operations that we do very often on data frames or on data is to add new information. And in the frame of a tidy data set, adding a new variable is done with the mutate of this writing. <coughs> the mutate function of verb adds the new column. And the last important um, operation is grouping. It's, for example, splitting this data, data frame into two parts. For example, group A and group B, assuming this is defined here where we have A's and here we have B's. The effect of splitting this data set into two sub data sets is done with the group <coughs> underscore by function of verb. And once we have these two independent sub data sets, we split our data set, we then can apply different calculations in the groups using, for example, a summarize. Or if you want to calculate summary statistics, or tally function if we want to count how number, number, how many observations we want to count the number of observations we have in the different approaches. Okay. So this is the program <coughs> regarding uh, when it comes to dplyr for this afternoon. So um, here's the IPRG data and. This IPRG, and so let's first remind ourselves of the IPRG. Let's remind ourselves of the columns <coughs> of the variables that are available here. <coughs> and so, if I want to select, for example, protein and run, I could use the select function IPRG. <coughs> protein and run like this. Ah yes, of course I forgot to load uh, the dplyr package and um, this we, we can do like this. dplyr and now select and here there. Um, actually what I'm going to do is that I'm going to transform this IPRG Data frame. Okay. Here it is. It's a data frame, and I'm going to convert it into a data frame-like structure that has somehow nice properties in terms of um, being printing out. Um, and that's a table. Um, and I'm going to check if my f the function s underscore table yes the function s tongue underscore table is available. So I'm going to convert IPRG as a table, and so I'm going to overwrite it here. Okay. So if now I rerun a uh, class IPRG, it tells me that it's still a data frame, but in addition to that, it's also TBLDF, a table. And that's the, um, the new type of data. And one of the nice features of this is the way it's printed out. And there are other um, useful features that we're not going to look into here. So if I print it out, it tells me it's a table with that many rows, that many observations, and that many variables. It prints a few out, and um, tells me that this is a factor, a double factor. And then here at the bottom, it tells me that I have that many more rows and four more variables. A bit more convenient to work with, especially on a small screen. <coughs> so let me now select here from my IP RG data set variables protein and run, and this is what I get. I get a new table or data frame that contains now only protein and run with IP uh, in the return. And 
<coughs> now let's look at the set. So that means what's select here. Let's look at the second um, functions that we have, which is filter. So, oh, still working with the IPRG data set. And now I want to filter. And let's say I want to keep the rows that have a condition that matches condition 1. Um, actually, oh, it is, yes. um, I'm going to calculate a table here of IPRG condition just to convince myself of the, how these conditions have been coded. So as condition 1, 2, 3, 4, as a string, condition 1, condition 2, condition 2, condition 4, and not as numbers, not with 3, 4. <coughs> and so if I want to have an exact matching on a string, I would use the double equal sign towards the Here, this is how it works. Here's my output. So, because I did my filtering, my selection only, my filtering in the observations, I still have my protein of two intensity and five other variables. Here they are. I still have all my points, but now only for 9,079 rows. 10 that are displayed and 9,069. <coughs> Select <coughs> and filtering. Now, that data manipulation really is chaining many of these operations. When we filter, we select, and there are additional operations that we're going to see. Um, and to make that easier, we are going to use a pipe operator. Um, that is available in a package called Magrit R. So if you could load package Magrit R, and Magrit R provides this new operator. Okay. <clears throat> percentage sign, right arrow. Percentage sign, greater than sign, percentage. And it allows us to do these kind of things here. So let me first use this only with the uh, select, for example. So here would be this new syntax, protein wrong. <clears throat> so you produce a valid output, it's exactly the same output as I had before here, but it works as follows. This um, pipe operator expects to have a tidy data frame as input and then passes that data frame to its right and if the thing on the right is the function as it's here the tidy data frame that is passed is going to be set as the first argument to the function so we wrote select data variable and then call names. <coughs> now this data variable becomes implicit. It's what is going to be fed into select by the pipe operator. So we do not need to uh, repeat ourselves <coughs> and pass this argument. This argument here, the first one we select, is going to be what is fed to the pipe. So we can omit it and only focus on the column names that we need. I'm sorry, just for, what is the percent? Um, so, percent greater than percent is this uh, operator. Okay. It's the piping operator. It's a co combination of three, uh, three characters. And so now this becomes the equivalent of that. <coughs> so if we only have one operation here, it is not terribly useful. 
uh, we actually have to strike more characters. Oh, and by the way, the shortcut in our studio for this is Control Shift M. This will produce automatically the pipe operator. But still, there is not yet that much benefit. However, the pipe operator becomes very useful, very important when we start to chain more than one uh, operation. So, for example, if we want to select certain columns and do some filtering. So, for example, let me repeat this filtering with condition, with first condition one. Here, filter, condition, condition one. And then select. <coughs> so here's what's, what's happening. Uh, we don't see the pipe operator at the end, but it's there. I have a tidy data set. This data, tidy data set is passed to filter. I don't need to repeat, uh, repeat myself. It's implicitly passed to filter. Filter does its filtering, it does its business. And what's the output of filter? <coughs> it's a tidy data set. Um, so this tidy data set is now, that is the output of filter, is piped into select. We don't need to repeat ourselves. What does select do? It takes a tidy data set as input and does select specific columns and returns a, uh, a tidy data set. So if we want, we could keep on piping and piping and piping. <clears throat> and the fundamental assumption here is that we know that we start with a tidy data set and we know that we'll, we will end up through all this piping with a tidy data set. Now, we don't know how many rows and how many columns this tidy data set will have. This will depend on the operations. But we have <clears throat> the guarantee these tools have been written so that all the functions we're going to see here, take a tidy data set as input and return a tidy data set. Sorry, did I miss your yellow sticker? Yeah, sorry, if I, I'm not used to the yellow color. <laughs> I'm very confused by the yellow color. If I don't see it, that please call it. So what, through this chain of operations? Ah. <clears throat> that is a very good question. So let me rerun it again. The IPRG dataset has not changed. The IPRG exists here and has been fed into a filter that modifies what it gets back and then feeds it to select and so on. But IPRG has not been modified and the output of this chain is displayed here in the console. So it's kind of very short lived. It gets produced, gets printed, and then it's lost. So if we are interested in keeping the output of this data, then I'm going to call it a temp here. We need to kind of move back at the very beginning of our chain operations and run it again. So now nothing is printed on my terminal other than the commands that I that I run, but now I have this new tan variable here, which is the modified, the filtered and selected IPRG. <clears throat> so this, this piping, and actually, mm -hmm. um, and this is valid for all the functions in R, will never modify the inputs that they are passed. To modify the data, we need to explicitly either create a new variable or override the variable that we use as input. And if you were to override it, you would just call it IPRG again, the same way you said that. Yeah, we, we, we can try this. Yeah, it's fine, I, I think I'm going to um, But let, let me IPRG. So here, um, oh. okay. so these are the dimensions of IPRG. 36,007. 
if now I override it and then look at the dimensions again, the dimensions now are 9,079 9, and 2 because I have overridden IPRGD. The, the new content of the variable is independent from the previous content. Um, so in this case, I kind of lost the data that I had because I overwrote it. Um, but that's not a problem because I can load it. Uh, I can load it again. And so that was to select for select and filter. Um, let's look at mutate. <coughs> and so let me check again the variables <coughs> I have protein of two intensity, one condition by replicate intensity and attack replicate. So, let's say I would like now to have a log 10 intensity column. <coughs> I could do the following. I'm going to, from now on, use the pipe, or at least uh, in this session, IPRG. And now I want to create a new column. So for that, I use mutate. And mutate works as follows. Uh, I first need to come up with the name for my new column, and I will say, I will call it log 10 int. So we say typing equals, and then how do I need to create, how do, what operation do I need to do to create this log 10 intensity? Um, I'll, we'll want to use the log 10 function, and as input to this log 10 function, I need to pass. Uh, intensity. <clears throat> so within um, the arguments, within the parentheses of these functions, I can refer to variables with their name. So really this means take this column, this variable intensity, and apply log intensity. Um, if I run this like, like it is, I will not see very much. So I'm going to select Lock ten. Lock. Lock ten. Eight. Okay. And here it is. So to make sure that I can see what I created, I create this column and only select that one for these lines of changes. Oh, actually, maybe I could. No. Select two of them. <clears throat> oh, something I forgot to say, and that's I think something that caught my and that caught me last week. Um, the order of operations is important here. If I try to do uh, if I try to do this. This would not work. This produces an error. Let me read the error. Okay. There is first some obscure gibberish that we don't understand unless we look at the code, the implementation of code. What is useful here it says that object collision not found. And do you know why he complains saying that object collision is not found? <clears throat> well, people that were with me last week, they must know because <laughs> I was very confused that suddenly what I expected to work did not. Exactly. At this stage, after selecting, I don't have any of the condition code. So the order of operation. Um, will matter. I'm going to leave it, but I'm going to um, comment. Oh, no.
Okay, so I'll um, ask you to do a little exercise at this stage. Let me maybe find one. Um, okay, the exercise would be create a new log 10, as we have done here. Um, log 10. No. Create a new log 10 intensity divided by 2 column. Or 8 column, call it the way you want. A column that contains the log 10 intensity, but that divided by 2. And then only keep the observations. Uh, I'm going to call this x. Observations that have x greater than 5. And only display. Protein, ROM, and X. <clears throat> uh, do you understand the question? So we start with IPRG. Currently, IPRG has 36,321, I believe. Rows and seven columns. So I first would like you to create an eight column that key I call X, feel free to call it whatever you want. And that column should contain log 10 intensity divided by 2. Log 10 intensity I put there, but add something else to it divided by 2. <clears throat> so that would be the kind of first step in your piping. The second one is a filter <coughs> observations that have a value greater than 5 for this new variable that you created. And finally, the third is to display these three columns. So this requires filter, this requires to use select. And this requires to use mutant. So could you take, unless you're ready with it, with that exercise, take your blue sticky notes down and put them back on. Put them back up once you have finished with the exercise. Uh, or call me or use your yellow sticky note if you if you have a question. I'm not sure. Um, if you're completely lost, you can call me, but don't hesitate to talk to your neighbor. Uh, two people have already done the exercise because they knew how to do the exercise even before we started. So don't hesitate to ask them, help each other. Or call me. <clears throat> or ask them. Uh, she's here to help out. Okay, small change. Do not use x greater than 5, well you can, can do, but use x greater than 2. But the actual value is not relevant as well, as you know the, the syntax. Thank you for mm -hmm. Ah, good. I was getting worried, I didn't see many blue sticky notes, and now suddenly, Yes, I just made the exercise up on the spot, which shows. give you a couple of more minutes. Uh, and I have already... Um, 
prepared the kind of the skeleton that really follows the way I have it. Um, explained it, create a, a column, we fill the observation and we select columns, we create a mutate, we fill we filter with filter and we select with select. So I will ask somebody to help me out here. Uh, mutate. How do I create a new variable name? Anyone with a loud voice, otherwise I will not hear. Um, lock to the 10, intensity. Divide by two, like this. Okay. Uh, oh, I, I, I said I would call it X to save myself some typing. And then I want to filter. How do I do that? One or two, doesn't matter. And then how do we select whatever we want to select? I can figure that out myself. And I originally asked for five, and that returned the table with two variables, but zero rows, because there was no value that was greater than five. Do you have those? Pardon? Um, yes. The x here refers to the x there. Um, if I called this Look. No, oh. Yes, yes, because this tells at this point before running, also, oh, you select going to filter. You select. What if I, oh, sorry, that's what you mean. Yes. Uh, if that was the question, yes. Um, well, it changed that. Uh, this is, I, now I couldn't see the value that I just produced. Yeah, sorry, that, thank you. Um, and so the last very important uh, verb in, in dplyr is the group by uh, <coughs> that will take my data set um, and split it according to um, um, according to a variable of interest. Um, and so the variables of interest are any of my column names. So for example, let me try to use condition. And so this produces the following output. It's still a table with the same dimensions, but we see here that it has a grouping variable. Condition, and we have four conditions. And now we can perform um, calculations on these different uh, conditions, such as, for example, the mean intensity. So because we grouped by condition, and there were four conditions, as output of group one summarize, we get a new table, but this time it has four rows, because we have four conditions, and two columns. Condition, which is the variable that we used for grouping, and the mean intensity, which is what we asked to calculate. We can um, uh, name the new columns that we create, and we, um, we can create multiple columns. For example, here I could also take min intensity. Okay. So in one go, I can generate multiple columns. <clears throat> Similarly, um, group 
condition and if I were to want to count the observations I could take the tally function and that one's going to count all the observations it's all. Yep. Um, sorry, the console or the. And the condition here, the tech, uh, grouping can also be done according to more than one variable. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to start by explaining it here with a simple with a um, with a variable. So if I create a variable x and assign it x, I would write it like this. But I can also write it of y equals to. <clears throat> so the equal sign is has two meanings. One is to create a variable and assign it a value. The second meaning of the equal sign is to pass um, what's the example I used last week? <clears throat> no. I don't remember. Um, so the sac function takes a value but creates a sequence from, let's say, 1 to, let's say, 5 by steps of 1. And so the second meaning of equal is to pass arguments to functions. Uh, as we, we saw last time, I could also type 1, 5, 1, and then the mapping would automatically be done. This is the mapping by position, this is the mapping by name. So we have two meanings for the equal, creating var uh, variables or assigning values to variables, or to pass arguments into functions. The double equal sign is a comparison operator. Is x equal to 1? Or is the value containing the variable x equal to 1? If this comparison is true, all returns boolean true um, is y equal to 1 it's not so the output is false so the double equal sign um, is a comparison like uh, y greater than 1 is false oh, is true smaller than 1 is false Now, if we come back here, so the meaning here is the same one as creating a new variable. I create a new variable, mean underscore int equals this, but it's used in the context of calling this function. Whereas, I think. Above here early on. Here, always as a context of inside the function, I use the equality of it. But what is somehow weird or in the syntax here is that you know, they are used inside in the context of the function but it's assignment and comparison
So, um, I would like to briefly remind you or introduce ggplot2. I'm going to create um, a new script here. And then script 3, library ggplot2, because this is what we are going to use. <clears throat> so, um, base plotting, or the plotting functionality that comes by default with R, uses the kind of canvas model, where, uh, for example, if I want to plot the sequence 1 to 10, it produces the plot, the plot is there, and there is no way I can change it. So plots are rendered, but they do not exist as variables within R. Um, and there is no way for me to modify that plot other than reproduce the new one. Now, this is different with ggplot2. With ggplot2, you would construct the visualization object with a set of functions, with a set of directives. I would say this is the major, the biggest difference with ggplot2. Um, maybe another one is that, and, and by building these plots, uh, what you, the information that you pass to ggplot2 is not what's the color that you want to use, what kind of um, you don't, provide, you don't define the visual aspects. You can, of course. But you provide the data, you define the mapping, and ggplot2 will figure out how to present it, using, a bit, using its own default values, which are considered to be better than uh, base plotting. But uh, you, you'll see, as you'll hear this afternoon uh, in Steve's lecture, um, even ggplot Two's default are not necessarily ideal, but they are certainly good enough as far as we are concerned uh, for, for this course. So, um, what do we want to do now? We are going to use the uh, ggplot2 to visualize some features of, of um, this IPRG data. Um, so, the very first step in creating a ggplot2 plot is to tell it the data that we want to to uh, to visualize. Um, here we go. So this is the first step to use the ggplot function and to tell it this is the data that I want to analyze. And when it comes to ggplot2, uh, the only thing it knows about are, are data frames. Whenever you want to plot something with ggplot2, you will need to convert it into data frame. And typically, it's the kind of long format, uh, long data. So this is the output of calling ggplot2 data. This is what we get, kind of the empty plot. But at this stage, ggplot2 knows that it's, it will have to produce a visual representation of this data set. The second thing that we need to To define is the aesthetics. This is done with the function a yes, and the aesthetics, among other things, will map which parts of the data we want to use along the axis. So, for example, here we say, well, IPRG, you remember we, we had seven columns. Well, the column that we want to map to the x axis would be condition. And what we want to plot along the y-axis would be log 10 intensity. Or was it log 2? It was log 2. Okay. So if we execute this, um, here's what we got. Our gray background, as we had before. But in addition to that, we map the condition. And ggplot2 will figure out automatically that in condition, we have two or four categories, condition one, two, three, and four. So it will displace these, display 
keys, and it will also figure out that log two intensity is a continuous variable and display this in a continuous y axis. Um, and as, at this stage, I'm going to um, store this output into a variable p. And the last piece of information I need to actually obtain the figure is to tell ggplot2 what um, geometrical visualization I want, what kind of geom ob um, object I want. Um, and these are always defined by geom underscore something. And here I would want to use a geom box plot. So in addition to the data and the mapping by adding geom box plot, what we obtain is the visualization of these data along these uh, axes using the box plot. Another useful um, aesthetic here would be the color. And let's say I also want to do the coloring uh, based on the condition. So let me regenerate this object P and display it again. Uh, and, and it uses this color. But actually what I really wanted is not color, but I wanted to fill So this is how a GG book works. My data, my mapping, and my geometric uh, objects, my representation of my figure. So um, I can also stack up different geometrical objects. So for example, if I have a P here, so P <coughs> defines my data and my mapping plus geom point plus geom um, for example violin for violin plot I keep my original mapping but I will first display these as points oh. yes um, let me first just say point, so here they are. <clears throat> These are all the points for condition one, all the points for condition two, and three. But actually, what I probably want here is not the points as they are, but a jitter. So jitter will maintain the actual intensities, the value on the y-axis as they are, but add a little bit of noise on the x-axis, the condition, and these factors. So that I can start to distinguish um, points. Uh, something else I'm going to add is an alpha channel to add some transparency. To limit the effect of overplotting. Now we have so many points being overplotting that even adding an alpha channel doesn't really solve our problem. We will see other methods to uh, deal with overplotting, and, and I, um, I think Stephen will also talk about this later. Anyway. But coming back to what I originally wanted to do, geom violin, I can overlay multiple geometric objects and parameterize them mechanically uh, to obtain something like this. But probably the most important feature for me when it comes to ggplot2 is the faceting. So I'll still um, carry on with my plot p here. Um, let's say I will still display uh, my box plot. But I will want to do some additional grouping, a little bit like we did beforehand with the group by. And this can be done with the facet uh, faceting. Uh, 
for example, faucet grit. Um, and as you can see, um, I think the computer is struggling a little bit uh, because it's also recording. Um, Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I messed up my, my syntax. So the faceting, <clears throat> the faceting is like the grouping, if you want, but in terms of visualization. I have my data, I explain how I want it to be visualized, but I want this visualization to be split in multiple facets, and the way I want them to be represented is uh, along these additional dimensions that are my technical variables, Technical variables A, B, technical replicas A, B, and C. So by specifying facet of grid tilde, technical replicas, here's what I have. I get it. So the tilde um, is a symbol that, that is found um, very often in R, for example, in terms of modeling, when you want to do statistical tests. And it, you can read it as a function of. So do the faceting as a function of technical replica. And it means use the technical replica variable, group it or split, split the data, and use it here. And like the group by that we had where we could put multiple grouping levels, we can also do this here. Here we create a two-way facet grid with the technical replicates A, B, C, the biological replicates 1, 2, 3, 4. And in this case, it happens that all my biological replicates 1, whether these are technical replicates A, B, or C, match condition 1. With condition 2, match biological replicate 2, and so on. That's why we miss uh, data along the other conditions. But the faceting is extremely powerful when it comes to ggcode 2. Um, now I'm going to switch to the slides to show you to do material to show you um, some other aspects of ggplot2. Um, and then I'll um, let you finish with a kind of rather um, big exercise that brings together some notions of a deep plot and some notions of ggplot2. And these are color scales. So Stephen is going to talk about this uh, in great, great detail and one of and why using some colors is important and avoiding others. But we have also already had a very nice example of this um, in Michelle's um, keynote lecture. And whenever you want to choose colors, in our <clears throat> one place you can go is in the, is in the R color viewer package. I think somebody asked the question to Michelle after her talk, and she mentioned color brewer, which is a site where you can choose different palettes. Well, actually, there is a package called R Color Brewer here. And then if you call the display all brewer all function, it will uh, show here all the palettes that are available in the R Color Brewer. So depending on what we need to show, 
for example, if you have the categories, these sets here allow you to differentiate up to 12 categories. Um, and these have been chosen so that you know, these different colors can be separated, even if suddenly you have two points of any color that come next to each other. So, um, or spectral, uh, spectral um, divergent, divergent spectral um, palettes. But um, Stephen will go into these, these details. Yeah. And so, for example, um, so here I use the CRC data frame. That was the wide format where I have my different proteins on columns and samples on rows. I create this um, uh, representation where I map my data and I want to uh, I produce my data and I want to map one protein on an X, the other protein on a Y, and the color should be defined by int the intensity in the third protein. And I want to display these with a, as a scatter plot using a geometric point. And so I can now start to, so these are the values for the protein on the x value. Here are the values for the protein, my second protein on the y value. And then the colors here reflect the intensity of my protein, my third protein. And ggplot2 knows that this continuous scale, knows to use a continuous scale here because of that provided more continuous data. And using this viridis, I'm not sure if that's how to pronounce it, viridis, viridis, um, color scale, um, I think the default would be from a kind of light blue, dark blue towards black. Um, <coughs> I, can, I can change, I can adapt. Um, the color scales as needed. And there are tons of uh, examples in the slo um, slides. For example, here using the blue scale, the blues from our color blue. Um, here's an, uh, another example where I plot, I do the same mapping, one protein on X, the other protein on Y, but this time I ask for the colors not to map to another protein, but to map to <coughs> subgroups. So each point here is a sample, and now what I represent here is the different groups they belong to. And so ggplot2 will figure out what kind of coloring to use, whether it's a discrete um, variable as here, or continuous. Uh, customizing plots, I will uh, let you um, experiment with this. Um, and again, Stephen will talk about the um, background of this. Uh, we shall say, use titles. This is something you can do with the labs function using titles. You can use captions, subtitle, label the x and y axis in meaningful ways. And for example, do I still have my plot? Here, clearly, along the y, uh, x axis here, I'm doing a really bad job. I cannot read my conditions one, two, three, four. So there would be two solutions here. It would be to rename condition one to one, condition two to two, and so on. But another alternative would be to tilt. Um, and of course, I've lost my. To tilt. And my text, by for example, 90 degrees, and then my conditions um, ggplot2 comes with a set of themes, black and white, grayish, minimal white, and so on. Um, and then they will control a whole range of visual aspects of your plot. Um, and not individual ones, which you can, of course, Customize as you wish. For example, I here the orientation of the text through the theme function. Uh, 
Um, if you need to start, I'm going to open this here. Um, if you need to start to combine ggplot two figures, uh, then I would recommend to have a look at the patchwork package. Um, and you can try it out with, um, I will regenerate the, the, the content, so it, it, it displays the figures. But so I have two plots here, P1 and P2. These are the scatter plot, this is a box plot. You can start to compose ggplot objects with, for example, P1 plus P2, and it will create one figure with the P1 and P2. So by redefining plus, um, to concatenate um, ggplot2 objects. And this can also be done row-wise, p1 plus p2, but this time we want to add one column. Okay, so we redefine um, <clears throat> the layout. Um, and it's possible with the kind of a patchwork syntax to uh, embed the layout one first row with one wide figure, and then here's one figure, and two other figures here. Uh, so again, this probably comes more towards the end when you want to customize your figures into one final figure uh, for communication. So, oh, is, is it until three or half past three? Three, okay. So we have about 10 minutes left, so I would like you to um, have a little bit of fun with dplyn and ggplot2 to produce, for example, a figure like this. So this is the CRC data, and it's one figure that we could produce to kind of explore our experimental design. Um, so with the player, um, I grouped into gender, male and female, and then I grouped into CRC and healthy, so I think that's a group uh, variable. And for all of these subcategories or subgroupings, uh, I counted. Oh, and I also kept the age. Actually, the age is a continuous variable, so I bind my ages into, in this case here, five categories. Very young patients to older patients. And then I counted how many, how many observations I had for age group, gender, and CRC part of the group. Um, and then I visualized this um, by plotting the numbers of observations. So we see that we have generally few uh, young patients, and actually no male is healthy. Young is this um, We see that um, we are missing old in male altogether. Uh, we see that we have actually many an average age group in as healthy males. That's the highest number there. So the answer is already in the in the lecture note. So if you if you prefer to go through the the answer yourself, but this is one example. And um, to generate these categories here, you can use the cut. So in your dplyr code, there will be a mutate okay, to create a new column, a new variable that are these bin pages. So I suggest um, we wrap up this afternoon session with this exercise um, for five minutes or so. And then maybe tomorrow, oh, tomorrow from eight to nine, We have a question and answer session. This is optional, uh, except for me. So I will be here at 8. I might be a little bit late. I didn't manage to be here at 8 last week. But uh, if not, well, I'll, I'll be on time tomorrow. Um, so in this question and answer session, there, uh, it's open to you to ask anything you're interested in, whether about the material that we saw today. For example, if you want us to go over this exercise in detail, that's what we can do, but the answer is there. 
Uh, but if you want for us to go over the answer together, we can do that. If you have any questions about DeepWire ggpod 2 or any of the material that we saw, feel free to ask clarifications or any other questions related to visualization. Okay. So please um, use the rest of the time and to do the exercise, and then in five minutes or so we have the refreshments. Uh, while you go, or when you leave to go your, for your refreshments, could you, something that was particularly useful um, today on the blue sticky note, and something that needs improvement on the yellow sticky note, and leave them here. Okay? Thank you very much.